This video is sponsored by Keeps. More on them later. There's an old adage that states that there's no such thing as a bad idea, merely bad execution. Whoever said this is a stank bitch because frankly I've been on the internet most of my life and I've definitely seen more than my share of bad ideas. Every single video game ever made has had concepts that never made it off the cutting room floor and so I've got a lot to choose from today, but given how a lot of the unused content is just slight variations of what we ended up with, I want to go a bit further in this video. If you're trying to be as creative as possible with a new game, then you're going to keep every option open as part of development, even the incredibly strange ideas. You'd rather have too many ideas than too few, I suppose, but I want to focus on the ideas that should never have been anywhere close to a video game. Specifically not the test placeholders like the R-Wing in Ocarina of Time. Like no one on the dev team wanted a spaceship in this game, it's just to test the targeting system. Instead I want to look at content that could possibly have been in a game that you know and love. This video will be looking at some questionable ideas to put it lightly, but I gotta say, you're gonna struggle to find a better idea today than keeps. Two out of three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness before they turn 35, and so we have to be thankful that keeps are doing so much good work in this field. These guys are very clever when it comes to preventing hair loss with their FDA approved treatment that comes with years of experience and a ton of successful cases under their belts. In fact, they're so smart that they know that hair loss is different from one guy to the next, which is why their treatment comes in three different variants depending on what kind of hair loss you're experiencing. Plus, you can get everything shipped directly to your door so you don't have to wait for the world to be not so terrible before you can fix your hair. Keeps his treatment packages already cheaper than their competitors, but with the deal they're running with me here today, you can save even more money. For a limited time offer, you can go to keeps.com forward slash rabbit or click the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. Stop hair loss now before it's too late. Anyway, it's time to talk about some non-video game stuff. If you reach into the farthest, darkest corners of your mind for inspiration, you might be surprised what you find. There's been plenty of games made in the past with ideas behind them that are scarcely comprehensible to the human psyche, and if this is what was kept, then damn, can you even imagine what wasn't? Mother 3 becomes more and more fucked up the further you go into the game, and for a game that started off so innocently, it's a hell of a tonal shift. There are loads of moments in this game that lean on the more emotional side of all the death and destruction that punctuates so much of this game, and it creates these real high points of a Mother 3 story. It's a game that knows what it's doing and doesn't try too hard to hide where all this is leading to, but it also plays with the idea of dreams and visions and just a few hallucinations to keep you on your toes. Hey, with subject matter this depressing, maybe dreams are the way to go. There's a lot of information floating around online about Lucas's nightmare, and it can be a little challenging working out how much of it is real and how much has been fabricated to make this little nugget of unused content from Mother 3 stand out more than it already does. The name itself is fan-made since no one on the dev team decided exactly how this sequence would work, but it's a very appropriate name since it's effectively some backgrounds and art assets of Lucas's brother Klaus that... Um, do a bit more. I know Earthbound has Geigers, which is just a terrifying smorgasbord of creepy imagery, but if the devs were able to incorporate Lucas's Nightmare in the final version of Mother 3, you would have to wade through multiple forms of some kind of boss fight where Klaus's face becomes more and more distorted and progressively less human-like. Like, what the fuck is this? I feel like Shigazato Itoi understands childhood trauma better than most developers out there, and that's based off of the incredibly messed up version of Mother 3 that we ended up with. With this extra sequence, that conclusion could only ever be compounded. Gotta say though, I don't need to see naked Klaus, and definitely not naked robot Klaus. The words you didn't expect to say today. Few developers are as forward with their unused content as Valve. Their developer commentaries shed a welcome light on the behind the scenes of creative game development, but sometimes what they leave behind can be far more interesting than what they end up keeping in their games. Literally all of their major releases have some batshit insane stuff cast aside, but given that the original Half-Life was designed to be a bit different and to uproot established conventions of first person shooters, then I absolutely have to talk about Mr. Friendly. Before doing some heftier research, Mr. Friendly was one of the most striking examples of unused content that I already knew about, and now I'm going to try to talk about him without having this video demonetized from orbit by Susan Wazowski herself. Given that Mr. Friendly looks like a larger, more off-kilter version of the iconic head crab, itself inspired by the facehuggers from Alien, then you can kind of see where this is going. It's like a large, horse-sized head crab, so obviously it's going to do some... Oh... 
some of that, I guess. So it's hard to tell how much was finished with Mr. Frenny by the time that Valve realized that putting a sex monster in their FPS game would probably be a little too unconventional, but I probably don't need to elaborate too much on why exactly this monster remained unused. The story behind it is someone else though, because they ended up using a sketch that a 12 year old drew this weird looking monster as inspiration, with Ken Birdwell showing it to Gabe Newell more out of curiosity and maybe a little oversharing, and Gabe in turning around and saying, yeah, this is exactly what we need for our video game. Half-Life supposedly has undertones of psychosexual alien encounters designed to unnerve its target demographic of adolescent teenage boys and having a giant alien kill your character by getting too frisky with Gordon Freeman was apparently the way to go. Not really though, because Half-Life would likely have ended up with an adults only rating and as Valve's first game, that's not really the way to make you start in the industry. Show some goddamn restraint and save the sex monsters for later. It's fun to look back on old console add-ons to get a slice of what developers thought people would be interested in. The Game Boy Camera is such an interesting point in history where Nintendo were convinced that people would be keen to use the Game Boy as a method of taking and printing off these grainy low-res pictures of themselves, and hey, I'm sure it was exciting at the time, but history hasn't been too kind to it. At the time though, oh man, you could do anything with it, especially bolting the feature onto a semi-serious first-person shooter and finding some way, any way, of using the Game Boy Camera in a game like Perfect Dark. Yeah, it wouldn't be my first choice if I had to pick any game to use the camera with, but if people have dreams, who am I to stand in their way? The story goes that the team behind Perfect Dark, which included most of the people who worked on GoldenEye for the N64, they were very keen to push this new shooter to the limit and try everything to distinguish it as the most advanced game they could make at the time. One such suggestion was, get this, to scan people's faces into Perfect Dark by using the Game Boy camera and to then stick those faces onto the models of enemies throughout the game. So by using this fancy new technology, you could take pictures of yourself or your family or your friends, get them a supporting role in Perfect Dark and then gun them down without mercy. Rare were excited to find a way of making this work within Perfect Dark despite the moral implications, but in the end, they were halted in their tracks by the massacre at Columbine High School in 1999, and since this renewed some fears that violent video games promoted similar violence in real life, Perfect Dark's camera feature ebbed away shortly after. The most we've had since has probably been Face Raiders for the 3DS, and at least that was goofy and used enough augmented reality to play into the fantasy. Any excuse to stay away from the Game Boy camera is fine with me though. Those error faces still mess me up. By the time that The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom releases in 2023, it will be the 20th mainline Zelda game, spanning 36 years and dozens of consoles. It's a franchise of a lengthy established history both in-game and in real life, and despite changes in setting and premise, the Zelda games have all been fairly consistent. Even Breath of the Wild with all of its Sheikah technology isn't such a huge leap from the more medieval attributes of other games. If anything, it helps drive a wedge between Link living off the land with wooden tools and the big scary robot octopuses with laser eyes. Oh no. Given its relationship with Zelda 1, it makes the inclusions of Guardians all the more jarring, since Breath of the Wild is trying to harken back to the bygone era of deeply medieval Zelda, where the land is harsh, everything is either brown or green, and Link's life expectancy can't be pushing much past 40. However, in the Berenstein universe, we'd have to make peace with the earth-shattering reveal that Legend of Zelda was built on something entirely different and altogether more futuristic. Yeah, the wide expanses of Hyrule would be traded out in favour of new Neo-Hyrule, with giant billboards worshipping our very clearly democratically elected leader Ganon in all his pig-nosed glory. Oh damn, I must have squished the wrong insect. So yeah, Zelda, but set in the future. That's hand on heart something that I'd love to see Nintendo tackle one day, even if it's just a kooky spin-off. But you should know that I'm lying a bit, since Nintendo wanted Zelda to be all about time travel since its inception, and so Zelda 1 would have seen Link swap between future Hyrule, with all its technological advancements, and medieval Hyrule. I'm not completely sure why this was dropped, but if I had to guess, having two different versions of the same massive overworld would have been a challenge for the NES to run effectively, and of course, that would be almost like twice as much game for Nintendo to design, so no. No, not yet, anyway. There's a lot of artifacts left from when Zelda 1 had a futuristic side to it though. Namely Link's name, which I know Miyamoto has said in the years since that his name is Link because of his ability to link between the player and the character, but nah. It was always the link between past and future since the first game. 
Similarly, the Triforce wasn't so much this mythical force passed down from the gods, it was due to be a microchip that Link would piece together from different time periods. I feel like The Legend of Zelda would lose a lot of its mystique if all those lofty fables were instead talking about a lump of technology. You gotta know that barely comprehensible god magic works a lot better here. Still though, give me that futuristic Zelda one day. I wanna fight Cyborg Ganon. <laughs> If Zelda 1 being part futurist sounds wild, then you're gonna love it when you hear what Nintendo were planning with the original Super Mario Bros. This one makes a little less sense, since Nintendo already had their start with Mario Bros and Wrecking Crew to a lesser extent, so they weren't exactly working with nothing here, but all the same, the creative minds behind Super Mario Bros floated around a few drastically different game concepts. It's strange to think that some increased enthusiasm in a different direction would have completely shifted the style of Super Mario Bros and every new Mario game after that to something radically different, but I suppose much like Zelda, it was only ever considered. Thank God for that, because I don't know how the world would have survived if Mario had gotten his gun. <laughs> Ah, not quite, but surprisingly not a million miles off. Before Nintendo and Miyamoto had set their sights on Mario Continuous prowess as a platformer, they workshopped a few different ideas, the strangest being that Mario would ride on a cloud and fly around shooting enemies with some kind of gun. An interview that Miyamoto gave to Famitsu in 2010 shed some more light on this, with Shigi explaining that for a large part of Super Mario Bros.'s development, the controls were A to shoot bullets, B to dash, and up on the control pad to jump, which already sounds pretty fucking insane as far as a control scheme goes. Even when it was decided that this game would focus more on platforming, Miyamoto still wanted stages where Mario would be riding his cloud and raining down hellfire on those poor Goombas. The bullets eventually pivoted to fireballs, and then when platforming became the primary focus, the fireballs were locked behind a power-up for balance. Still though, for a surprisingly long amount of time, Mario had a weapon and was using it to ruin the lives of the invading force in the Mushroom Kingdom. Mario and Rabbids over here being late to the party. If you had fun with this video, make sure to like and subscribe for more in the future, and hit that bell for notifications of every new upload. And if you need something else to watch right now, I made this video last week with my experiences of Mario and Rabbit Sparks of Hope. I also want to thank my top supporters on Patreon, including Raina Baina Bobaina, Scott Riker, and Sarah Malion. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.